is the General Overseer of Voice of Freedom Ministries International, with headquarters in Benin City, Nigeria. A man called and specially anointed to set the captives free. It doesn't matter how long your situation has been. It doesn't matter how long the crisis in your marriage has gone on. I know one thing. You are coming out. Known all over the world as an apostle of deliverance. That which has tormented your family for 40 years. In my name of Jesus. Shall be broken. It broken. Shall be broken. It shall be broken. It broken in the name of Jesus. Jesus. No. An outstanding teacher and preacher of the world. With deep insight and understanding. The devil will leave you under the anointing, but will return on the foundation of doubt. Spanning over three decades in the deliverance ministry with undeniable testimonies, signs, and wonders following. The author of the bestsellers, Altar vs. Altars. Discover to rediscover. Witchcraft manipulations exposed and the ever popular lose him and let him go. His ministry has seen him widely traveled in Africa, Europe, the Middle East, and USA. The Lord say, I will perform what you see. If you see total freedom, say it. If you see that you are going to get married, say it. And now, in the power and might of the Holy Spirit, Let's receive the dynamic ministry of Bishop Abraham Chibundu. I'm going to round up my teaching that I began two weeks ago. Turn your Bible with me if you can hear me. Zechariah chapter 1, verse 18 to 21. Zechariah chapter 1. Then lifted I up my eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, What be these? And he answered me, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And the Lord showed me four carpenters. I saw problems and the Lord showed me solutions. I saw problems and the Lord showed me solutions. May the Lord show you solution in the name of Jesus. Then said I, what come these to do? And he spake saying, these are the horns which have scattered Judah so that no man did lift up his head. But these are come to free them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. I prophesy to you this morning, whatever horn set against you to scatter the things that God has created and gathered for you, such horns I command them to receive fire this morning in the name of Jesus. There is one solution to horns, and that is to uproot them, to destroy them. Zechariah said, I lifted up my eyes and I saw four horns. And I told you that the horns represent powers, authorities, and they had assignment and the assignment is destroy Judah scatter Jerusalem scatter Israel so that there will be nobody no significant no important person to come out of these places and that was what these horns did in those days they were strange nations powerful nations that came against Israel but in our time it's not nations with certain powers, certain authorities that have operated in various places, in our homes, in our businesses, in our families. The assignment is to make sure no significant person will come up.
They may have succeeded before hearing me. But after listening to me this morning, you will be the first significant person coming out of your family. If you say amen, you receive it. And last week, I was sharing with you of these horns, what they are. And we took two of them to explain that these horns and these powers, they are we saw personalities in the Bible that explain who they are. We looked at Goliath last week, Sunday, and see how Goliath a spirit can engage you and keep you fighting, fighting every area so that you wouldn't have chance to pay attention to your destiny. But it took one young man anointing to destroy Goliath. One significant thing about these four horns is that death is their ultimate end. And I don't care whether they are human beings, whether they are spirits. One significant thing in my heart and one burden I have is that they must expire. Oh, I don't have your attention. I wish I have your attention. Goliath. Then after we looked at Goliath, we looked at Herod. That Herod is another horn. And Herod's assignment is to kill the future. Is to kill our tomorrow. His assignment is to kill whosoever is coming up. He deals with leadership. He deals with people in authority. He gave order to kill all little children without mercy. And you know your children are your tomorrow. I'm just wondering if there is any food in the world that I have not eaten. If they are around, that means I didn't eat them by choice. Like when I traveled to Congo, Congo has a delicacy of cassava leaf. That is a delicacy in Congo. And uh, I have never one day tested it. Because when I ate cassava leaf in 1969, when I joined the army, I didn't find it funny. That was during the war. We were eating cassava leaf. The Igbos are not known to be eating cassava leaf, but we did. Because that was the thing available without salt. So when I travel to Congo, they present it. I don't want to touch it at all because it reminds me of a bitter experience. So if there are food, so whatever I am living for, whatever I'm, I'm struggling now to achieve is for my children, is for the future. But the Herod attacks the future. When a man's future is destroyed, when he gets to the future, there will be no future to have. When Esau was manipulated, it was Herod, the spirit of Herod, that manipulated him to mortgage his future. So he sold his future. When he came to the future, there was no future anymore for him. May Herod not collect your future in the name of Jesus. The next horn we need to deal with is the horn of Jezebel. The horn of who? Jezebel. Jezebel is a horn. Is an authority. It's a power. In case you want to write some scriptures down, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1 to 3, 2 Kings 
chapter 9, 1 to the end. Let's read 1 Kings chapter 19. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. And we tell her how he had slain all the prophets with his sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow, about this time. And when he saw, when he saw, when he saw, he didn't hear, he saw, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. Go to verse 4. Verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. What could make a man take his life? Why do people commit suicide? It is the spirit. It's the spirit of Jezebel. Spirit of Jezebel... People think Jezebel is a woman who dress gorgeously, a woman that dress and do makeup, and they look at her and say, Jezebel, a woman that put artificial fingers, they say that's Jezebel. That has nothing to do with Jezebel. Makeup, beautification has nothing to do with Jezebel. Jezebel is a spirit. And that spirit is called witchcraft. We are ever, please listen to me this morning, for the few minutes I'm going to speak. We are ever, you see, frustration. We are ever, you see, weeping, unending. We are ever, you see, tears. We are ever, you see, bloodshed. The person that is involved, is witchcraft. Witchcraft specializes in making it so tough, so hard, so that you will say to yourself, I give up. Let me die. I'm not better than those who have died. Let me say this to you. You are better than those who have died. Because if God didn't have any need of you, he should have allowed you to die with them. But because he kept you alive, it means there is something in you that, give, that excites God. There is something in you that makes God happy to watch you live. Your existence makes God happy. That's why you didn't die. Therefore, don't give up on yourself because of Jezebel. Jezebel is a manipulator. It's the spirit that manipulates you. You think you are in the right direction only for you to discover that after years you are in complete error and you have wasted years. Jezebel is a calculative spirit. Doesn't just attack plans ahead of time work it out neatly the problem of the church is that we fight haphazard the battle we just when we see the enemy knock at the door we start praying and start fighting before he knocks at your door he has done his arithmetic I said to the pastors this week, the devil is not a foolish spirit. The devil 
is an intelligent being. You should consider the position he was holding before he became the devil. You should consider how he was to the point he could convince one third of the angelic host to confront God. The worst thing you will do in your life is undermine your enemy. Underrate your enemy, sorry. If you underrate your enemy, the enemy that can finish you, you say is nothing. You will die like a cockroach. Put your enemy where he belongs to and face him. I am not exaggerating the devil. I am not praising him. No. But I know that he can do too many things. So, there is no need of giving him chance. Whoever said that if you want to eat the devil, you should take a long spoon, deceived you very well. Because the devil, whether you have short spoon or long spoon, if he's after you, he's after you. His saliva can finish you if you eat in the same pot. Why would you eat in the same pot with the devil in the first place and thinking that you have a long spoon? Keep the devil where he belongs to. Don't, don't, see, I, I, there are certain messages I hate where somebody said the devil is nothing. Who told you? Paul said... We wrestle not against flesh and blood. He used that thing. We say we wrestle against principalities. Check the word principality and find out what it is. Then he came to Second Corinthians. He said, "Although we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty. Look at the weapon. It's mighty through God." Why is it mighty? To pull down what? Strongholds. If the Holy Ghost can describe certain issues as stronghold, who are you to say the devil is nobody? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I